lot about that in terms of things like recycled content, and that's, that's still part of what we do. But there are other things you can do to reduce the energy use, to reduce the type of material harvested, um, the amount of material used in product. So that's why we focus on procurement. Now, our program at the state level focuses on government procurement. And we do that because we buy a ton of stuff collectively at the government level. Um, government spending all levels in our country is more than 15% of the gross domestic product everywhere. So that's a lot of concentrated buying power. And if we can target that, we not only are we leading by example, which is I think why a lot of us do what we do, but we can demand change in the marketplace. And we've definitely seen that directly in, in our work. Um, most recently, one of the examples is the state contract for imaging equipment, multifunction devices that we all have in our offices. We wanted to require um, that the product meet a certain standard. And I think four of the five vendors on our current contract at the time had products that were in line to meet that standard. And the other ones didn't yet. But we pushed on this, and they told us in our meeting later on that they had advanced um, their product to get through that standard because they knew we were going to be requiring it in the next week. So right there shows you, you know, maybe they were going in that direction anyway, but we can push things over the edge. And I think that's, I mean, a great opportunity that we all have. So our program is a partnership between the PCA and the Department of Administration's Office of State Procurement. They're the ones that manage 1,700 plus state contracts for goods and services. So um, a lot of a lot of opportunities, um, but um, we've been working together since the 90s to create more sustainable state contracts, and um, it's a really great partnership. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we um, built our relationship over the years. Maybe an example for you all um, to think about how you might be able to partner with your person. So as I mentioned, our program started with a focus on environmentally preferable procurement. Um, recycled content, maybe some toxicity reduction, and um, we really focused, we gave focus on the environmental piece. But the Department of Admin had their own social mandates that they had to meet, as well as all the economic pieces. So all of these things were happening in environmentally preferable procurement, um, but we weren't looking to balance them and we weren't really understanding each other. So now we've moved into this new sustainable procurement program where we're saying, you know, all of these things are interrelated. Um, one is not necessarily more important than the other. They have to interact. And um, as a result of that, I think we're coming, coming forward with um, a more holistic look at sustainability. Um, it's not without its challenges, but we're working on it, and I think we'll all be um, better off. And I know that a lot of, um, I think, I can't remember which Sean or Shannon when I was talking to you about this, was saying, well, we have a lot of um, an effort on diversity and inclusion in our city now, and so it's great to hear that the state is looking at that. And the thing is, we've been looking at it for a long time, but now that it, there's higher level emphasis on it, um, I think we're starting to see um, contracts that emerge that are found in all of these different ways. You're not expected to read what's on the screen right now, but I just wanted to um, share that that we've had this program, this environmental proper person program, in place since the 90s, but we've never documented it, and we've never had a formal agreement amongst our agencies. And as a result, over the years, we've, um, we, we haven't done as, as effective of a job, I think. And certainly, depending on the administration, our efforts have waxed and waned. Um, but with this charter that our agencies have just signed, um, we formalized our agreement. We formalized our resource commitments. The PCA commits one full-time staff dedicated to this with a technical assistance from other subject matter experts in our agency. And the Department of Administration, and this, this is completely new, the Department of Administration has committed that all of their job descriptions for the people that do the contracting in their office will include responsibilities for sustainable procurement. And the um, acquisitions manager who oversees all the development of the contract, as well as the chief procurement officer, they have included um, this language in their work plans, so and they have dedicated time to work on this program, which to me is huge. We, we've always had it as kind of this program is PCA's program with, you know, agreement that the Department of Admin will help us, um, but now it's a true partnership, and it's really exciting. And right now, this charter is um, 
getting kicked up to the commissioners of all of the other cabinet level agencies of the state for their commissioners to sign on as well, um, which again is a really good symbolic effort, but also um, it actually will have tangible benefits because they'll be called to the table when we're developing new contracts to provide their input and so that when the contract is in place, they can't say, no, we don't like it. It doesn't meet our need for an acquisition. So it's, a, again, a true partnership. So our program priorities, um, we are really focused on the life cycle impacts of products. Um, we're looking all, all along the spectrum of the life cycle as well as looking at the environmental, social, and economic um, impacts. Again, don't expect you to read this, but I wanted to share one way that we're prioritizing our efforts is um, through the results of a sustainability-related spend analysis that we did of our, of our contract. It's something that you all could do, um, but you also don't have to. I'm going to share a resource that you can look at um, to kind of cross-check what other cities have found. But essentially what we did was we took all of our 1,600-plus state contracts at the time, 2013, and ran them through a life cycle analysis tool to look at what the environmental impacts were of contract categories. Spend. And so now we know, number one, what we're spending the most of our money on, um, and number two, which contract categories are the most impactful. So what we saw in this assessment, and this doesn't include the professional and technical contracts, and it also doesn't include um, the contracts that MinDOT has in place separately, so that's a whole other area of spend that we'll have to look at later. Um, but for now, we know that state agencies spend a ton of money on IP goods and services. And there are a lot of environmental impacts associated with those. We were looking at it through the greenhouse gas emissions lens, um, so that's what we were focusing on. But IP goods and services um, and chemical manufacturing, those are two of our top five categories of spend that also had high environmental impacts. Contracts that fall within those categories are the contracts that we are targeting over the next year. So that's one way to look at it. Um, if you didn't have the resources to do that, we had a contract and a, a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to do this. So we had the money. Um, if you don't have the money to do something like that, it's, oh, sorry. That's just a teaser. Um, I'm going to share a resource that you guys can use um, to, do, to do a similar analysis if you guys have the resources to do your own analysis. Um, so one other thing that we have been trying to do, um, not without challenge, is to measure the impacts of our work. Um, and we're trying to do it in meaningful ways. And so that's a challenge because we don't have all the tools or calculators to measure what the benefits are of buying certain products. But when we do have a calculator to use and we do have the data from the contract, we're using those. And so um, this, these impacts are covering one year of purchases of recycled content paper, and one-year purchases of computers as well as multifunction devices. So we use a paper calculator, and we use the EP electronic environmental benefits calculator. Um, and we're able to estimate how much water we saved, how many greenhouse gas emissions we prevented, and how much energy we saved. And this, is, this, is, this communicates really well, and I encourage you if you are able to track even your paper purchases, um, because there's a lot of benefits to be gained from purchasing recycled content paper instead of virgin paper. And people see those numbers, and when you compare them to other numbers, I mean, we did this in our own strategic plan, to the um, technical assistance provided through MINTAP and RETAP, two, two programs that EPA supports. The greenhouse gas emissions from one single contract and one product were pretty large relative to the greenhouse gas emissions avoided from some of that technical system. So I encourage you, even if it seems small, to take that data, put it into this calculator. I'd be happy to help um, because the communication power of this is pretty large, especially when you put it side by side with other efforts. Um, Okay, um, another thing that we've tried to do is put our name out there and put, um, and, and put ourselves in for awards uh, because we've, we're realizing that gaining recognition is good for people who um, have to support your program. <laughs> they like to see that you're being recognized. So again, by tracking our purchases of EP products, 
you can submit for instance to or they they plug in that data for you. Um, maybe um, Sean might share some of her success using the State Electronics Council um, tool as well. But um, they calculate the environmental benefits for you and then they recognize you as an as one, two, or three star EP purchaser, depending on which type of product you're buying. So it's just kind of a feel good thing. Um, you get recognized for, for making the right decision. And the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council is um, a national nonprofit that the state of Minnesota is a founding member of. And every year, you can submit, if you're a member, you can submit a case study. Um, so we submitted a case study for some work we had done um, in sustainable purchasing, and we were recognized for that as well. So these are some successes that we were able to, to share with leadership, and it and definitely sends a good message. Um, additionally, we have 17 state contracts that include sustainability criteria. That's probably not the whole universe of which contracts would be considered sustainable, but these are the ones we've directly impacted. And I consider that to be a success. I'll share more on those. Um, finally, I wanted to share um, a new effort at the state level that um, I think is allowing our program to um, elevate its importance. And so we, the governor's office created a new Office of Enterprise Sustainability last August, I believe, and um, hired a director to make sure that state agencies' operations are more sustainable. And procurement is one of six focus areas in this new enterprise sustainability effort. So we have an overall goal for sustainable purchasing, um, and some ident we've identified some levers using the state contracts that agencies would, would use to meet that overall goal. And so again, I think it's, it's rising in importance, and our impact will definitely be greater. So that's the overall um, summary of where we are at the state level, how we're thinking about sustainable purchasing, and now I'm really excited to let Shannon step up here um, to talk about the work. Did you want to start? Oh, sure, yeah. I would be happy to answer any questions at this point if that's easier. Yeah. State contracting. So the more that the city in terms of getting sustainable products on state contracts, what is, that helps our cities, right? Yeah. yeah. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the in my I'm gonna let the cities present and then um, in the last part of this of the actual presentation I'm gonna share information about state contracts. Um, but yes, exactly. The whole most of the state contracts for business services um, are um, accessible by local governments. So um, your cities I, I looked at the survey results, it looks like most of the people that answered the survey are using state contracts. Um, and definitely a lot a lot of the contracts most of the spend comes from local government. Yeah. Just a question about EP. So EP uh, arose to serve public and private sector, so it's a standard that Yeah, yeah. So sorry. I kind of forget how much detail to go into. <laughs> In case you aren't familiar, EP is um, a standard for electronic products. The the full name is electronic product environmental assessment tool, but no one says that anymore, just EP. <laughs> um, and they rate products, um, bronze, silver, whole, and then they go through an auditing process um, to make sure that the products are actually compliant. Um, so it goes the whole life cycle of the product from the beginning to end of life management. So the benefits are, are pretty pretty big. It doesn't cover the social side, but um, but maybe in the future. So yeah, and then they have this great calculator that if you track even basic information, like I bought you know, 100 bronze level tablets and 100 gold desk, you can plug that into the calculator and it out for the environmental benefit. You, you, don't, you can track pretty minimally. You can still measure. Does the MCPA still have a point? So I have that later, but we do have we have a group called the Green Group um, that historically had um, county environmental staff focused on recycled content, um, you know, more solid waste related stuff. Um, and over the years, the group has kind of ebbed and flowed. Um, so we just recently moved it to a biannual meeting. But if there ever were interest from from Green Step Cities folks in general 
to meet more regularly or, or meet, meet, meet biannually, I, I would be happy to coordinate more. It's just well, what I was realizing is the folks that were typically attending, the county folks, um, had very little time in their work plan to work on sustainable purchasing, and it didn't feel necessarily worth their time or my time to meet quarterly. But um, yeah, so I have information on that later, and happy to do more if, if there's an interest or interest. <laughs> All right. Hi. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Shannon Pence. I'm with the City of St. Louis Park and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and some of the successes we've had with implementing our, I'm calling it EP3, as I cannot say environmentally preferable <laughs> purchasing policy <laughs> in a row multiple times mm -hmm. in a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, these are what it's going to cover. This is basically the purpose of our EP3. And I have to thank our Environment and Sustainability Commission for working with staff prior to me coming on board a few years ago to write this policy um, as a partnership. And so it was adopted in uh, June of 2015, right after I started with the city. And therefore, my job has mainly been trying to implement the policy, which has led me to understand that we needed some training and language explanation and so it helped me learn a lot about how we purchase things in the city. So it's been a, a, a great task to, uh, to take on. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So obviously we uh, want to conserve on anything we can. So natural resources, energy, water. <laughs> I am <have> what? Do <laughs> you think it's done? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never heard it do that before. So. <laughs> Uh, we obviously want to minimize environmental impacts such as pollution and even the use of toxic materials. So getting back to life cycle analysis and, and not just life cycle costs, but what does it take to even make that product before we even decide to purchase it. Um, reduce waste that is obviously landfilled or incinerated um, and also try to encourage purchasing of things or services that um, have strong recycling markets. Um, and then again, back to the staff time, life cycle cost, life cycle um, analysis or impact on the environment or human health as well. So it kind of covers what you'd expect in a, in a policy um, like, our, like this. So with that, who does it impact? Well, everybody in our, you know, in our entire city staff. So it could be anyone, anyone at any level. And I mean, we've got vendors that we work with and so Anyone on any level could be working with a vendor, but they might not be a purchasing person, um, typically, in their role. Uh, any contracts, so anybody working with a contract, they might not typically buy things on a regular basis, but they might work on contracts. Um, and then, of course, anyone working with grants. And so there's a lot of little touches all over our entire city um, with our city staff, but not everyone has a specific job in this. And so it really depends on their role in the department. We don't have a purchasing department. Everybody is all very decentralized and various people have various roles in how this, this policy might impact them and the work that they do. So it's, um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges. These are all the categories that are covered in our policy and I think the policy, Philip, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can get it through the Green Sub Cities um, website. Yeah, it should be posted. Under your entry. Under my entry. So if you go to my city, um, who's doing it, you can then click on who's got that, that policy available. So these are the categories. I'm not going to go into them. We don't have enough time, and, and you can certainly read up on them on your own if you want. But um, I can give you an example. With Under the category of purchased energy, this kind of gives us the leverage and the okay to purchase things like wind source or renewable connect with some of our accounts of XL energy. I mean, this gives us that, that tool in the toolbox to go ahead and maybe migrate some of those accounts every year and can budget for that year after year and increase those accounts and slide them over. This also helps with our, we're almost done with our climate action plan. So when we have that, there's going to be areas in which this policy can help, again, be that leverage of that tool and say, look, we've got this tool, we've got this policy, and we've got this plan. 
let's merge the two and see where they overlap and where we might be able to make an impact on our greenhouse gases. Um, some other areas, increase recycled content wherever possible, of course. Um, so I'll show you some examples of where uh, one of our departments who has a, a bigger role in that area as far as like paper products goes and what they've done to, to make some changes. But the state, state law now is 30%. 30%. 30%. 30%. So we're going to have to increase that. <laughs> and even if we're at that now, we're going to have to look at mm -hmm. going better and being um, uh, we cover things like producer responsibility, even investments, and then, of course, future focus. So, um, you know, there's quite a broad array of topics that are covered in our policy. So, as I mentioned, some of the challenges. We don't have a purchasing department, and we're all decentralized, and everyone's doing different things. A lot of people have purchasing cards. They might be buying from Office Depot online. They might be running to Target. They might be um, managing a contract or a grant. Uh, and that might be the only thing they do that might be impacted by this policy. So there's just lots of different staff doing different things. And then, um, of course, if someone is only has, has a small role, like with a grant or, uh, or uh, manages one contract, we might not have reached them in our initial set of trainings because they might not have been identified as a, a primary purchaser. So getting through to everyone and getting everyone on board and understanding the policy and how it might um, impact their work world is, is still something we're working through. And then tracking. In the policy, it does mention that the sustainability coordinator, who had yet been uh, named and identified yet um, in that policy, will be responsible for tracking. That's just about all it says. So there's no software. We're not using a bunch of tools. I'm still trying to get through training and, and letting people know where they can help out. But uh, I did come up with a, an internal tracking mechanism that I'll explain to you in a minute. So um, it's, it's not perfect, but it was a start. And so everything is just a start. So don't, you know, as overwhelming as it was for me to read this policy as a new employee, I thought, how am I ever going to do this? Um, small steps. Well, small steps will get you there. So that's kind of what this story is, of, is my journey to going with that. Um, successes basically have been working with um, different going to different meetings, doing a high-level training on the policy, then learning who are the key purchasers in different departments, doing more training with them, um, creating the training or the tracking document, explaining what that means, and then doing subsequent deeper dive training in specific categories where we had opportunities to work with a particular vendor or tying it into an, another policy or ordinance, which I'll explain in a little bit. So I mentioned the, the tracking sheet. So basically, we have, a, we have a shared drive, put up a nice little simple Excel spreadsheet with different tabs for the different departments, and then drop down menus for the categories that correspond to what's in the policy. With, also, with, there's in that, in that spreadsheet are links to the policy and where they can find other documentation that helps them with the jargon and other things that might help them understand how it relates to what they might do or what category they might select if they're going to report a, a new way of uh, purchasing something or a change that they've done in their practice. And then I use that um, tracking sheet to check periodically and provide updates to whoever's interested or um, perhaps to our week, once, once in a while to our weekly uh, departmental team. And this is a screenshot of it without, you can't see the tab, but this is the IR department, which is our communications and our IT department merged together. I, I like to use them because they've been our shining stars of reporting. It doesn't mean they've done the most, but they've done the most reporting on what they have done differently. And because they do purchase a, a lot of the copy paper and other paper products, and of course they run all of our communications, so anything that gets printed somehow, they're responsible either for that contract or getting the job done internally. And so they have a, a lot that they can do. Is there a pointer in Oh, <laughs> that was not the point. <laughs> Well, um, you can see that they've been changing a lot of the, um, if you're looking at the slideshow, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but they've been trying to get to that 30%, making sure that all of our, we're meeting at least the, the requirements and that 30% from recycled content for a lot of the paper, and then switching and moving it up from there. So over time, they're changing all the copier papers 100% for consumer recycled. Um, Another example is uh, they uh, are trying to buy more and more reusable items for our internal meetings or even um, events or meetings that include the public. So 
tablecloths as a reusable um, glasses, actually made of glass that can be washed in the dishwasher. Um, they were the ones who actually bought a couple, a hundred of them uh, for the entire um, for all of City Hall to use. And if we need to transport them to another building, um, we certainly could do that. I, I'm not sure if it has happened, but they were the ones who took it upon themselves to just pay for that and get that order. And then also with the IT department, um, as part of this larger group, uh, they decided to um, embark on trying a software program that helps manage our computers and our monitors and turns them off on schedule so that we can save energy that way. And so they uh, they entered that in there as well. And there's a picture of the uh, brand of the software, New Boundary, that we are trying out. I think we've had it about a year or almost a year that we've had it running, maybe since June or July, I think it's launched it. And those are the glasses with a lovely logo on it. <laughs> so we have a couple hundred of those and they're right now and they're in our in our kitchen for all the staff to use on a regular basis. But we've also got all the reusable dishes in there for, for all the staff to use. But we use those now for like picnics and parties and meetings and events as long as we have enough for everybody. So people are getting on board and using this because we have a very nice dishwasher. We should be using these things. We don't need to buy compostables. Even though we can compost them, why should we do that if we've got reusables? So try to think higher up on that chain. So I'm thankful to the IR department for their contribution. Now another opportunity I had, and this was because um, I've been working a lot with Office Depot as a new person trying to figure out, you know, what kind of green opportunities do you have? And they do sell a lot of um, they have a lot of tracking that they can do. They can kind of give you your greenness factor from light green all the way to darker green. They can um, do things with your, um, they can make your, the people who are purchasing be restricted to certain kinds of products. And we weren't going to go that far right off the bat. But those are some of the things that your vendors might be able to provide, especially the ones that sell thousands and thousands and thousands of products. Um, so. To me, that was a natural step for me to partner with them and say, well, what can you do for me on this? I, I need to get a handle on this. I know we don't buy everything from you, but we have a lot of different people who, who do buy from you here and there. And they're not necessarily where we spend most of our dollars, but this is where all these different people who have a little bit of purchasing power all across the whole city, um, all the city departments, this is where they go. This is their go-to place. So this was a good fit for me. And so what we were able to do is create an environmentally preferable purchasing preferred list. And so anybody who has an online account in the city can go to their my can go to my list. And they might have other lists that they've created for themselves. But what pops up is an EP3 preferred list. And on that, the beginning is all of our compostable and recycled food-related serviceware that they can buy. Now, we do encourage that they use the state contract, which most of the staff didn't even know we had access to, didn't know how to use it. So through early trainings and conversations, we were learning a lot about what people didn't know. So that, we'll get into a little bit more about the training in, in a moment. So because of uh, having two staffers uh, in our solid waste team that are focused on this, and also a zero waste packaging ordinance that was about to go live in our city, which meant anybody in our city outside of our city operations had to comply and provide composting and recyclability for their to-go packaging as well as having it on site for their customers. Um, it was kind of a perfect time to focus on that aspect. Plus, again, through those conversations, we realized a lot of staff didn't even know what could go in our compostable and recyclable bin. Um, it's just always a challenge. It's education and re-education and great signage and improved signage and that's something that's kind of always ongoing. So we first focused on that with Office Depot. We were also able to um, work with them to get specific um, categories under that um, preferred list. So hot cups, cold cups, recyclable versus compostable. A lot of staff didn't know like you can't put coffee in a in certain compostable cup, you know. They just don't know. This is not something they do every day like a lot of us do. <laughs> or they aren't as obsessed with it as <laughs> maybe. Um, so we did that to help also guide their eye to what they really need for to meet the needs. So they're not buying the wrong stuff and then they can't use it. So again, while we encourage them to use 
the state contract, because we're not that big of a city and because everyone's buying mostly for their own department, buying large quantities is not really going to work in most cases unless we've got a really big event like an annual employee event or something like that. Plus, we're not sure how long the integrity of some of those compostables last. So if they're sitting in a shelf for five years, are they going to perform as well as they did when they were fresh and new? So either part, we encourage departments to either partner together and order off the state contract, or instead of running to Target last minute, or, oh, we didn't know we were out, and they run here or run there, we know that they can get to Office Depot quickly. They already have an account, and now they don't have to think that hard, and they can get a small quantity. So that was really why we focused so hard on it. But it wasn't that easy. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. <laughs> the Office Depot is great, but they have thousands and thousands and thousands of products with 30 different green codes or labels on them. And thankfully, Emily Barker is very meticulous and did most of the heavy lifting and looking at all the possible compostable and recyclable food-related, event-related things that we could have on our list. And then almost went bonkers. <laughs> so Emily, if you're listening, um, she actually got to the level of having to call the manufacturer of many of these products because it was unclear whether or not they really complied with what our goals were and our policies said, and whether they even had the right green label on it. And so we actually did all this work basically for them so that they can then turn and make this list for us. <laughs> so you'd think this giant corporation would have all these staff working on it. They, they have like three staff. I think that work on green stuff for the entire corporation. <laughs> so, and and uh, so they were, you know, they were like very grateful that we did that. Um, although I don't know that they took those lists and did anything with it internally for themselves, but it got us to this point. So that was very helpful. And I have to thank Emily for for her hard work and being diligent on that. And so lastly, to training. So I, I've alluded to training a few times. First time I mentioned the policy because it was adopted and it was new, I brought it up at weekly meetings where we have a couple of, I, there's a manager's weekly meeting and then there's a depart cross-departmental weekly meeting. So I brought it up there and did kind of a high level quick training and then that's where I was like, I need every department to kind of identify at least one, if not more people from your department who tend to do the all purchases. And then uh, we expanded on that and did more training so we talked about high level of the policy, all the different categories, and the tracking documents that um, I had pr produced on our shared drive. And so that went over really well, and then we did kind of a secondary refresher training on that um, after some people had started entering some data into that tracking to reflect on who was like doing a good job and try to motivate and encourage others. And then also to hear back from them and say, but we don't know what these words mean. So this is great, but I don't even know what to put in the bins. We're like, okay, we're working on that. I got, I got a solid waste team now and I can partner with them. And so we expanded the training to include more people and to really hone in on that recycling and organic piece of things. So despite teaching them about Office Depot and about the public or the, the state contract, and also wanted to remind them that we've got this zero waste packaging ordinance coming down the line. And if you're working with, if you're a person who answers the phone, and you've got a, a group who wants to use one of our sites, and they need to know, what do I have to do for waste? Okay, so we need to set them up for success. So those people needed to be trained on how that pull-up or that ordinance was going to work, and then even what you can put in a bin in the city of St. Louis Park or the different bins that we have, and how do you even access some of those materials. Okay. So we did dive deeper uh, with more staff and talked about the term, a lot of jargon. What is recyclability? What do these symbols mean? And what do the numbers mean? And what is allowed in our program? So following, of course, the county, and then, of course, anything that was um, higher than what's um, required by the county. And so they not, not only did they get trained on how to do things better internally, but then how to communicate with either um, contractors or people calling in that are going to use our facilities or rent out something, um, and also how to access the materials. So we kind of drew up a nice document that reminded them about all these, all, this, all this language, all of the policies and ordinances that are related to this, where and how to order off the state contract, um, and a reminder of the, the preferable um, list on Office Depot, and just kind of a recap of all of that. And I think you know, it was really good. We had more people than the first initial trainings before 
I had Emily um, Parker on, on board, and that was really good. And I think we've seen a lot of change, but we still aren't tracking the way I would like to track. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot of the time that I would like to have to devote to using some of the calculators, because, but I hopefully will be going forward after our climate action plan is done, because we'd like, to get, we'd like to be tracking and seeing where we can give credit to some greenhouse gas reduction and um, in other areas, too, of course, that's covered with the policy. So, and with that, I will wrap it up. And I think we want to save questions or Okay. Yeah. Um, I love the way that you're addressing tracking these, you know, what you can do right now. Um, I think that's great. And I think that you have staff that are willing to, to input the data. I'm wondering, have, have you gotten reports from us at CIFO, like, to, like, so that your staff don't have to necessarily do that? or? Well, our tracking document covers everything. We're right now, obviously, both really focused on our compostable, recyclable, food-related, and yeah. events and meeting-related materials. Once I do more with lists with Office Depot, we could do that. They do send me a green report, although our my rep has now moved on, and we have a new rep, and I haven't met that rep yet, and I haven't seen a green report in a while. Um, honestly, we don't spend that much at Office Depot as a whole. It's not our biggest spending, um, but it was a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to expand our EP3 preferred list, but until that wrap is more on board, um, you know, I'm not sure how far we'll get, and it won't track everything because we have thousands of vendors and contracts and grants that we work with, and it would only capture mm -hmm. some small segment. We don't buy all our electronics from Office Depot. We buy them from Three other vendors, and so it's challenging. But someday, I'm data driven. I like to collect data. I like to have good data. That I would like to go in that direction, so that it's all literally captured by something. Uh, um, Jim, do you uh, find that some employees are receptive to working with you on purchasing policies, or find it just another inconvenience and another workload issue? I think at first it was like, because oh, we're always doing more, we're always doing new things, we're always training. We have a lot of great initiatives, and I think it can be very overwhelming. Um, but you know, I use the leverage of my boss, who's kind of the second highest person on the chain, um, being like the deputy um, city manager, and using her voice and saying, "This is what we're doing. This is a policy. Council signed off on this. This is important." And so she was kind of my my famous person at the top who basically helped set that tone and I asked her to, you know, to do that. And, and that meant she could convey that to um, the other directors who then you know, had to come up with a list of people who needed to at least get that initial training. And then the training grew from there. Other people who were just, well, what if I get a call? I want to know more. I want to be able to be helpful. You know, or I want to know if I'm a backup person, what I can do. So I think it kind of grew after, and people did quickly kind of get engaged in it and are totally behind it. And whether they're tracking as well as they could be, that's a different story. And, but that was just one way to try to capture and gain some momentum and then give credit to those. Maybe a little positive reinforcement, like, look at this awesome department, this awesome department, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to do that, do that wherever we can. But it's been a little bit, you know, it takes a little time. Question from the webinar. Um, this person says, way to go, Shannon. Uh, <laughs> any plans on expanding to pesticides or herbicides? I believe those are covered under our landscaping part of the policy, but I have to say, I can't honestly say off the top of my head that I can remember. And um, and we should, if we're not already doing it, we should, but that's under the jurisdiction of another employee who does a pretty good job of, of managing those contracts. So definitely every category in our policy we need to do more, we can always do better, and we can always raise the bar. Um, what's sort of the impetus behind all of the work that's going to start to be done on these? Does it come from residents? Does it come from council? Um, I would say par part of it's from our residents, that we go through a very extensive visioning process for our comprehensive planning, so environmental stewardship rose to the top the last two planning cycles. We expect it to happen again. Right now we're undergoing that same process, but even more in depth. So there is support in the community. I think we were the first city to have curbside organic 
um, organized collection in, in the metro or in the state, maybe. You might want to arm and pull a question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm just if you're listening. <laughs> I believe that people people are saying that. I've been <laughs> so, um, so part of it's that, and then, and then when we did offer that, you know, they wanted to see that increase. So they wanted to say this percentage, we're at 13%, we want to see 20% by this year. And so council is very behind this. And then, you know, then came the, um, the uh, ordinance on to, the zero waste packaging ordinance, which just kind of keeps feeding on that trajectory of interest in, in trying to avoid landfilling and incineration. Just one clarifying question. I just want to make sure. The policy was actually adopted by city council? Yep. And was that... Organized. Was that initiated through city staff wanting to see that go through, or did the council come and say, like, we want to see this? I believe our commission probably. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty darn sure that the commission said, we should have this. And council said, okay, we'll figure out it, figure it out. And they drafted it in, in combination with a variety of staff in different departments in, in partnership with that commission. So I didn't even get to draft or write any of this. So. <laughs> So help me understand an employee's choice. I, if an employee wants to run out and buy, needs uh, color paper, and I don't see any color papers. So, so this person in St. Louis Park can, has a card that they can go out to Office Depot. If they're buying from the state contract, what are the, what are the steps? Can you also run out to Office Depot and buy from Office Depot and sort of the state contract guy. I don't oh, no, no, they're not connected. Part. And the Office Depot is not the state vendor in, for the office supply contract. That's just they're the same as part contract. Just for the, okay. So usually, so unless, at least at the state level, unless you have an agreement with the vendor that the contract covers in the oh, purchases, uh, okay. and the state has a, I think a contract with Lowe's or, or Home Depot or something like that, and that covers in store purchases. But I don't, yeah, most of our stuff is on. All people do it online because that comes in a day or two. It's right. delivered. It's, you know, it's last minute, but it's last minute. Like, oh, three days we have yeah. an event. Yeah. I'm not going to get down the lit and paper. Yeah. Okay. You know, or you know, or I'm going to pay a fee to have it shipped quickly. So I'm going to order on here because I already know how to do it. Okay. You know, people know how to use the office people. But if I have a week, I could go to the state yeah. contract or yeah, state yeah. contract yeah. list. Yeah. And say I'm going to buy to the contract, and I'm St. Louis Park, and I'm placing the order, and yeah. you know me, and you know, yeah, okay. And we haven't trained to all of those contracts. We've only trained to the compostable related stuff that lint and paper is, is the contract for. That's what we trained to because that's what the most questions were about, and it tied into the initiatives that were kind of high on the higher higher on the priority list for now. So we have a lot more training to do, a lot more contractual training to do, um, and let people know what all, all the other state contracts that we have access to. Yeah. That's not necessarily known by everyone in the city. And if, and if it would ever be helpful for us to do some sort of training for your purchasers? What's um, on the... Yeah, like go through yeah. the contracts that would be of interest and talk about the vendors and the process and get them. I'm sure that would be beneficial for a lot of people. I only happen to know from a previous job in a previous life that we had access to all those contracts. Mm -hmm. A question from the webinar. Was Emily, who did that research for you, was she an intern or a Green Corps member? She's a full-time um, staffer, Emily okay. Barker. Um, she came from the TCA. <laughs> and so she's one of our two, I mean, we have more than two people on us always, but we have two people really dedicated to organic and recycling and the um, awareness. Oh, yeah. We have Emily on the webinar. She says hi. <laughs> well, she also says, backing up a little bit, that the packaging ordinance was initiated by council after Minneapolis updated their packaging ordinance. Okay, so that ordinance. Not the policy, but the to-go ordinance, the zero-waste packaging ordinance. It had so many names, mm -hmm. and I keep remembering all of them. So what was, can you repeat that again? What she wrote, it was initiated by council? Uh, yes, after Minneapolis updated their packaging ordinance. Okay. Sometimes we follow Minneapolis, go so look what they're doing, well, we can do that, <laughs> and we're right next door, so let's learn from them. <clears throat> Thanks, Emily. Yeah, it's always weird to go to St. Paul and get stuff and like die our phone. They're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> they're working on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks, Emily.
you're going to... No, no, okay. we'll go. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Shannon. Um, it's so true. You, you learn so much from other cities, so it's good to hear what St. Louis Park is doing. And uh, I just wanted to start with uh, where's Maplewood? So my name is Sean Finwell, environmental planner with the city of Maplewood. And Maplewood is a first ring suburb of St. Paul, just to the east here. We have about 38,000 people uh, as our population. We have about 130 employees in Maplewood, but we have one environmental planner who is about 10, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sure many cities experience. And maybe you don't even have an environmental planner to work on this sort of thing. So it's important to kind of get the perspective of various cities and see how they're doing it. I certainly am not an expert in environmental purchasing, but I've been around uh, with the city of Maplewood for 16 years. And uh, I worked on our environmental purchasing policy. And I'm going to give you a few examples of how your city can um, you know, take some simple steps to start implementing uh, more green purchasing. So I'm going to give you an idea of how we started this. Where did it all come from? Um, the city of Maplewood, we were uh, a recipient of an energy efficiency and conservation block grant back in 2009. And one of the requirements of that grant was that we do an energy efficiency and conservation strategy. So we had a little funding and worked with a consultant to put together the strategy. And one of the implementation requirements was that we develop future ordinances, zoning code and purchasing policies that favor energy efficiency, resource conservation, and local distributed power generation. So that really gave us a catalyst to start working on uh, some of those environmental purchasing requirements because it was an implementation requirement. The strategy told us we had to do this, let's do that. So I worked with our green team. We have this great green team that was formed maybe about 10 years ago. And it's a group of employees and we get together on a you know bi bi-monthly basis and we work on environmental issues for the city. And so having that support of a green team uh, was really beneficial in this case. So we created this policy, Maplewood Environmental Purchasing Policy, in 2011. And um, I'm just going to read this. Require the purchase of products and services that minimize environmental and health impacts, toxic pollution and hazards to worker and community safety, and to protect the larger global community to the greatest extent practical. And I think that key word there, you know, in order to get support at the time was to put in to the greatest extent practical. Because we do know that a lot of what we do as a city, you know, has environmental impacts and what is practical versus what is safe versus, you know, what, what is economic. So having that key word in there, you know, if it makes sense, it would be beneficial to, to go the green route. So that was in 2011 we created that. So the policy, I'll just give you a few examples of what it says, um, six examples. So source reduction, basically, you know, avoiding the purchase of any polystyrene foam packaging or styrofoam cups, things like that. Toxic reduction and pollution prevention, all of our cleaning products should be, you know, some sort of green seal product. Recycled content based products, all products can, should contain the highest post-consumer recycled content practical, but no less than 30%, which at the time, when we did our research, discovered that was the state law that, you know, government should be using this 30% post-consumer at a minimum. Energy and water savings, all products purchased by the city shall be US EPA Energy Star rated where available. Green building, um, we had adopted a green building code in 2013, which is, um, a requirement uh, that all of our city-funded buildings uh, be constructed to a higher level than the state energy code. So since then, we have about we have one private building. It's our new fire station, and then one public building even was built under that code. So you can see a little success there. But that was a requirement of the environmental purchasing policy. And then landscaping, um, you know, requiring sustainable landscape management techniques. So that was 2011, right? And uh, I thought, well, I've been got this policy in place. I am really looking good because at the time I had just gotten this environmental planner position. I've been with the city, like I said, 16 years, but started out as an urban planner. So I thought, success, wow, 
We're going to put that on our Green Step cities. And look at there. <laughs> 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 <We start. laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, we're doing pretty good. But you're like, well, now what? Yeah. <laughs> I got I got to deal with my nine other hats here. How am I going to get to all this stuff? <laughs> so um, at first, I think you know we made an announcement, went to um, like the department head meeting, talked about what this policy meant, how easy it was to implement. Um, we did some education, but I'll have to say that since 2011, there really hasn't been a lot of follow through. But I think what you'll see in my presentation here is that um, with little steps, people have kind of joined on without a real follow through. So the first big success we had was uh, in our dream team at the time, one of our uh, members had done all the purchasing of our paper products for copy machines. And we said, you just look at because what we what we had found, and I have a little crop here, is that we had uh, all virgin paper in our copiers back in 2011. And you know, if you're familiar with that, it's like really thick and it's bleached white. And you know, you kind of get used to that kind of paper. So um, we said, why don't you just look at how much it costs? And so it was really um, at the time, 2011, it was only a couple hundred dollars more. So we said, let's convert. And we did that with the support of you know, our department head. And we got a lot of flack. They're like, well, this is not very professional. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's all bleached white. And this is so kind of see through and it was a little different. And we got a lot of flack from that. And, but luckily, we had the support of uh, management. And they said, uh, they'll just get over it, which they did. Yeah, they did. Now it's commonplace. <laughs> that one there, that 100% virgin paper, um, I was working with a consultant recently, and that was from them, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I'm going to do a little education with them. <laughs> yeah. That was a little success. Um, another success was our church management plan we created in 2011. Uh, so we have a balanced approach to managing our recreational and park plans. Uh, we want to reduce the amount of turf in parks where possible, so you know we don't have to maintain all that turf. We have varying maintenance levels according to turf use. So our recreational fields, you know, we maintain more with we do use uh, the herb herbicides and um, for fertilizer. But then on the open spaces, uh, you know, where it's just active play, um, you know, we don't we don't do that. We don't maintain it that to that level. Um, then I also want to mention, um, so giving this presentation has given me an opportunity to go, what, well, where are we, and let's take a look and make some improvements. So since Trahanna uh, asked me to present with her, um, I've done a little bit of work. So um, first of all, I want to go into city facility lawn maintenance. Um, just at our last green team meeting, one of the members said, why do we keep you know, putting down all that herbicide on our city uh, campus, it just, it's just like toxic every time that they do that. And why are we keep doing that? And I thought, why are we doing this? <laughs> so I called, uh, we have a contract with True Green. And, you know, it's managed by our park superintendent, who, of course, wears nine other hats, too. And over time, you know, we had a just Knew that contract, knew that contract, but no one really took a hard look at what we were doing. So I called, I called True Green, and um, you know they have, they gave us options for moving forward in a more organic way. So you know we put down, we just do it once a year at City Hall facility, but we put down the herbicide to get rid of the broadleaf weeds, and then we fertilize. And uh, a better option is to you know try and thicken up your grass so that it chokes out the weeds and you don't need to use that herbicide eventually. So now we're getting some quotes to move forward with a more um, sustainable management plan where eventually we won't, we won't need those herbicides. So thanks for <laughs> See, these sort of things that forces you into doing good work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a good check-in. And then another thing that we looked at uh, when we adopted that church management plan was we had just created uh, and adopted this wetland ordinance, which requires buffers to all of our wetlands. Um, it's a pretty restrictive ordinance. Um, it's from a 50-foot buffer to a 100-foot buffer, depending on the classification of the wetland. But what we were finding was uh, some pushback from residents pointing to our parks. Your parks crew, the city, you're, you're mowing right up to the wetland. What's up with that? And then you lost that buffers. 
So um, we started this pilot project where you know we couldn't afford to go out and reestablish all the buffers with native plants. So we're looking at a few pilot, well, one pilot area where we just stopped mowing. But of course, you know, you're going to get the weeds and so forth. But at least we're, re we're, we're looking at reducing that turf, like I said. But. So another success since then is we created this Maplewood Green Events Guide. And um, this really just looks at reducing the environmental footprint of city-sponsored events. Um, in Maplewood, we have an annual Fourth of July event. Uh, we have employee picnics. Um, so what we have done, and with, this is one of the huge successes, I think, and, and where we've really got a lot of employee buy-in, is um, people like come to us, me and this other, and Chris Swanson, who's our environmental technician, they come to us as a resource. You know, they're like, you know, I'm planning the employee picnic, um, and I don't, I want, we want to try and make it a zero waste event. So you know that they're working with us to um, try and create these green events. And um, this guideline talks about waste reduction plans using technology and newspaper, choose venues that offer recycling and composting in public and back of house preparation areas, select vendors that offer the use of washable plates, silverware, and linen, and choose decorations and display material that can be reused or recycled. And I took a snapshot here. I uh, approached one of our administrative um, staff, and I was asking her about these are purchasing here, right? What's your experience? And right away she walks over and she opens up her cabinet and she goes, I bought all these compostable plates uh, for this retirement party that we had. I'm like, oh, good, right. you know? So it's really catching on and people are just doing the right thing because over time, it's kind of our culture now. And so I think that's key. Uh, we do have some challenges with this. You know, we do have a Maplewood Community Center and um, they have a banquet room and so forth, and we're working with those vendors. And then now that community center has been taken over by the YMCA, so I think we're kind of losing that um, connection and that commitment to continuing to go green. So there's some challenges out there. And then uh, Shannon touched on this, but I didn't realize all this was a lot of St. Louis Park's uh, work here. So, <laughs> <laughs> But again, I was asking that administrative person, um, Buy office products, right? And apparently, they all buy, you know, through office snacks. And she says, yeah. And when I, when we do it, we usually, you know, try to focus in on the eco-conscious, they call it, or recycled content, you know, a more green option. So that's something really simple that cities can do. Another simple thing uh, that we signed on to, and this was in 2015. The city of Maplewood uh, signed on to the State Electronics Challenge, and this is benchmarking an annual reporting for all your city purchased electronics. So this has really forced us to do some tracking in, um, you know, our computers and copiers and all that. So it's an annual report that you have to do, and this forced our IT department, you know, to really start looking at things. And since we signed on. Uh, we've discovered a lot of things that we really need to change. So it's a good way to kind of get other departments involved, you know, and like, hey, we're doing this challenge. You got to come on. Let's get going. And so they give you a report every year um, that gives you the environmental benefits of um, what you have done today. And what we found so far is um, right now all of our electronics go to uh, Pride for People. Exactly remember the name, but they take all of the computers and they revamp them and give them. They donate them to to people in need, and the ones they don't, you know, are recycled. But they're kind of a pass through, and they work with uh, a, a certified recycler. But you're supposed to verify that you're working with certified electronics recyclers to be eligible for certain points in the in the challenge, and because it's a pass through, they're not. So now. I'd like to work with the people that we uh, work with to recycle our electronics to, to make sure that they are getting certified because I'm, I'm sure it's not that big of a process. So this is an easy way to start working on your environmental purchasing. Um, another easy way, and this is free to us, uh, our green team, we have learned about the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program. In 2016, we were doing some work on, uh, we were trying to 
work on one of the Green Step City's uh, best practices, which is Green Fleet. And this is a simple way to go, oh, let's take a look at our mechanics area and see how we can green up that. So this program is uh, in place to strengthen Minnesota businesses by improving efficiency while saving money through energy, water, and waste reduction. Um, so they'll come to your organization or to your business and they did this assessment for us. Uh, and they gave us a report, and this is just a little example of uh, something in the report. First of all, they did say that Maplewood was doing pretty good with um, our purchasing and our mechanics were, you know, spot on with buying some green products. So that was good to hear. But there were some simple solutions they guided us towards, and one of those was um, looking at reusable sprayers. Uh, you know, I don't know, for brake, brake fluids and things like that. And so rather than purchasing those cans all the time. And so right there, you're saving $48 per year, reducing metal can waste by 129 cans per year. And then they also give you a report on the volatile compounds and, and the improvements in air quality. So this was a really great program. And again, it got our mechanics involved. And it was a program the green team was working on. And so now they're buying into it. So it's a good way to get that buying. And similar to Shannon's experience at St. Louis Park, um, some of the challenges are we don't have centralized purchasing. Most purchasers have a, you know, a city visa card and they run out to Target last minute. So that's a challenge. Another thing is, you know, education. Um, like I said, since 2011, I don't think we've had, we don't have this group uh, where we're meeting all the time to talk about our environmental purchasing. So again, Thanks to Johanna here, I'm on, I'm on spot, and I'm on the job. This was our latest Employee Connection uh, City newsletter, which came out just yesterday. And uh, all the cities are looking at this, and they're like, we have environmental purchasing all these <laughs> And so at the end here, I say that we're going to um, form a green products resource group, is what I called it, because I don't know about your city, but our city, it's always like, Congratulations, you're on the uh, diversity committee. <laughs> Congratulations, you're on the whatever committee. You're like, oh my god, my word. <laughs> so I called it a resource group. <laughs> I trick them that way. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, good incentive to get us going and, and at least touch base, know who's doing the purchasing, and talk about the purchasing policy and serve as a resource to, to our fellow employees. And then a uh, big challenge here is contract for services. I don't think we've done much with that. Um, you know, we do a lot of contracts for road improvement projects, um, and, and they have big impacts. So that's something I think is the next step. You know, we, again, have um, looked at some of those low-hanging fruits, but now we really have to explain out. And so I just wanted to wrap up with my favorite, favorite Dr. Seuss um, book, uh, The Lorax. I was digging around in my bookshelf this morning to see if my daughter's copy was still there, but I must have given it away. I'm so mad. But unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So <laughs> I had presented this to the department heads when we first adopted the, to the, the environmental purchasing policy. I was like, oh. <laughs> and so you know, that's really kind of been my uh, guiding go-to guy is the little ORAC. about uh, green cleaning products and services for you and Shannon as well. How, how 
how did you decide to like which third party certifications to include in your policy and do you know of any issues that have arisen with either cleaning products or services since the policy went into place? I will have to say that uh, you know we worked with this consultant at the time in 2011, and there were a couple certifications. So I, I don't have a lot of detail on that. Okay. Um, Chen, do you have more? I'm cheating by looking at our policy because <laughs> again, I didn't write the policy yeah, and, and, and don't have it. Could you mix up what's supposed to be policy? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have it ingrained in my. I'm sorry to take all this. No, it's fine. It's worth having a conversation. Uh, we've identified Green Seal, and then they specifically call out. 37 and 40, um, EPA's Design for the Environment Program Standard for Safer Cleaning Products are also qualified. Hand soaps and hand sanitizers contain no antimicrobial agents except for required by health board codes or other regulations, of course. And then those hand sanitizers meet um, UL 2783 standard. So I'm not sure if any of those are still the best or if it's time to look at the policy and make some um, upgrades in that area. And then there's other things like microfibers um, for cloths for cleaning, um, ionized water, surface cleaning devices, um, things like that. And then um, good, a good system in place for our material safety data sheets too, so that um, we can use that software system to um, look for opportunities to replace. Yeah, and I think that's something that our new resource group will be looking at. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of greenwashing out there as we mm -hmm. um, So I know we did get to this detail back in 2011, especially with our environmental commission when we brought the policy to them. Um, and such smart people, they were going through all this stuff. But again, I don't purchase the green products myself, so I don't know where we are with all that. But I think it's important to have that, that list of the certified products that we should be using. I'll just add it. The state contract for cleaning chemicals is in place right now allows Green Seal, Eco Logo, or EPA stamp of choice, which is formerly designed for the environment. Okay. Um, and you know, historically we've considered Green Seal and Eco Logo standards to be pretty on par with one another. Um, and EPA stamp of choice has kind of gone through an evolution, but um, other states uh, have gone through a pretty rigorous evaluation of the standards and accepted all three of those on their contract. So we felt that the goal was out. And we haven't had any issues for the most part with the vendor community not being able to meet those requirements for all the products aside from the protection. Do you do you have a complete streets or living streets I know you have one or the other or both mm -hmm. policy, right? No, we adopted a living streets policy in two thousand eleven. Okay, so about the same time as this purchasing policy? Maybe it was 2013. <laughs> so there's an overlap there potentially. So um, I don't know. I don't know your policy, but is, 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 was, was this policy able to be a lever in that policy to say we're not going to always replace like turf or we're going to, I mean, were there some aspects there that you're also kind of double dipping in those policies as far as street projects and you know, they're they're narrowing them and maybe, I don't know if you're adding native grasses or just replacing the turf for those strips between sidewalks and roads or if you know much about that. But Yeah, I, I think, again, you, you build this culture and it builds off of itself and then one policy leads to another and then it's just commonplace after a while. Right. So um, the Living Streets policy, of course, takes a look at um, the entire right of way and for road improvement projects now in the city of Maplewood, all of our projects require this living street. And you know, looking at multimodal pedestrians, bikes, cars, it's not just a right away for cars. Also looking at the natural resource aspect, you know, adding trees and the stormwater aspect, which is where you get the rainwater gardens. And I think something we can improve on in the living streets is using more more native in the rain gardens. Um, what we had found is that the maintenance issues with um, the native our, our uh, rain garden program has you know changed over time. It used to be where uh, if there was a road improvement project, a resident could choose to have a rain garden in their boulevard, but then they had to maintain it for three years, and we found that that's just not very successful because it's just not plausible for many people to know what's a weed and what's not a weed. 
-hmm. So now over time, you know, when we contract for these open streets projects, we have you're getting a rain garden here, you're getting a rain garden here. It's part of the design, and then our contractors install it, and then they maintain it for three years. Right. But I think that's something that we can improve on is focusing more on native in those living streets projects because you know natives are a little bit more hard to maintain than some of the decorative yeah. garden varieties. So thank you. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> I have to give time. Yeah, we have time. I mean, oh, okay. we have that whole period in the end where we were going to have discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just jumping back to the um, recycled content paper, it's clearly the, one of the biggest topics, at least, at least it's one of the biggest questions that I get. Um, and the typical call is, I've been working in a city and no one thinks that we can af afford 100% recycled content paper. And people have had bad experiences with stamps and paper. And so what do I do? So I always say, well, we have some positive experiences. <laughs> Um, but what's, what's been your experience in this city, other than people eventually realize the perception of like, oh, we'll get over it and stop get over more it. expensive. Yeah. That's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it jammed more in the top here. We never had that no. experience either. Yeah. I think years and years and years That's ago, the, okay. yeah. there may be more in <laughs> and people just don't want to. They don't want to let those past experiences from 10 years ago out of their brain. Or they, so they say apply that. it to, yeah. like it's still the same, like nothing's changed. They say that because they like the shiny, thick paper. I mean, you know, Or it's just them. change, which yeah. sometimes is yeah. always like, why do I have to even think about this? But, but if you have a policy, and your policy allows up to, maybe you can be specific and say up to 10% more, then you've got the green light to spend up to 10% more. So buy whatever you can within that range, and mm -hmm. it's done. So, but yeah, I agree with Sean. It's, everything has come down in prices. It's, mm -hmm. it's really yeah. almost not an argument anymore if you really have the time to look at it. But not every city has staff that has time to, to take a look. Yeah. And that's always the challenge is bandwidth. I think. Yeah, you get a job and you're like, okay, that's how they did it before. Yeah, I'll just follow it. Right. Do. It's easier. But uh, what we also found was, um, especially in our recreation department, they're using shiny or illuminated paper, you know, neon. <laughs> and you can't get neon paper that's any kind of recycled content. So we just. Quit buying that. <laughs> yeah. And we buy, we do buy the color paper, but you can only get that 30% recycled content. It doesn't come in 100%. So whenever I see someone copying on color, like, hmm. I give little speeches during the day. Yep, yep. <laughs> like you a, need to do that? Administrative uh, person, I, I just, you know, pat them on the back. You get the sustainability award of the day. Yeah. And it makes them feel good. Yeah. And then the other people feel guilty when I scold them. So. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Um, um, so the last piece here, I just wanted to kind of give you guys the tool that I see might be useful um, in your efforts. And uh, there's probably many more. I just I should apologize. Uh, I I've given versions of this presentation or on this Zoom multiple times in the last few weeks and I've got another one next week. So <laughs> if I seem to like be distracted and not know what's next, that's probably why. Um, but I think we have some great tools for you to, to access. Um, one is, uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with um, a group that was based around, I think, EPA Region 9, the West Coast Climate Forum. They have a climate action toolkit um, and they now have a Climate, just purchasing for climate uh, toolkit as well that staff from our office helps work on even though we're not on the West Coast. Um, and one thing that has become quite clear, not just through this project, but over the years, is that the greenhouse gas emissions and in general impacts that come from procurement of goods and services tends to dwarf your operational greenhouse gas emissions. So when we talk about climate action and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, we think about um, you know, reducing our, our, our build, the energy that comes out of our building or um, transportation-related emissions or, you know, things along those lines. 
all of those tie back to procurement and then some, because we have all of those emissions that come from the beginning of the life cycle of the product. So we like to present, present this to show you that if you're trying to address your climate impact, procurement is a wonderful tool to help you meet those, meet those goals. Um, and along those lines, there are a whole bunch of other impacts that are larger, not just greenhouse gas emissions, but, but all of the impacts along the life cycle environmentally and socially um, that you can address through um, better procurement. So as I mentioned earlier, the state was able to secure a grant that allowed us to look at our spend on contract and prioritize um, through that analysis. Um, but the West Coast Climate Forum has done this for you. Um, they consolidated the results from over 40 life cycle analysis of spend from um, public entities, so local government, um, higher education institutions, and some states. So our analysis was folded into their um, consolidation of results. And just so tiny, I'm sorry, but um, but the blue bars are public agencies, the red bars are higher ed, and um, oh, sorry, I forgot. Green is the utility, public utility. Um, so um, public agency procurement, this is mostly local government, so where you all would fall, um, a lot of their advanced gas emissions come from procurement of construction and maintenance services. So think of cement and all the emissions that come along with installing those types of things. Um, that's a huge area of emissions. Um, and then professional services and community programs is another big category for local government procurement. So, um, I strongly encourage you to take a look at this. I include the link. Do you all send out the, the slides later? Okay, great. So um, that link is included at the bottom of this slide. It's a great report. Um, Alameda County offered up a, um, I think, an intern or, or you know, short-term employee who consolidated all this information for everyone else to use. And um, that way you don't have to justify some, some budget to do this analysis on your own spend. Great if you have that, but if you don't, I encourage you to go here and take a look. They dig more deeply into these areas, and then they have um, guides for different areas of, of these procurements. So if you want to start targeting diesel emissions and construction use, there's a guide on the West Coast Climate Forum website to walk you through ways you might do that. So improve your policy. This is another one. Um, I think most of you have some form of policy because Green Step requires you and Best Best 15 to have a policy on environmentally careful procurement. Um, but there's always a chance to improve it if you, if you at the start just did the, the minimum um, requirements. You can certainly go back and improve it. And a few years ago, I worked with the local government group that Sean mentioned, um, the Green Group to identify best practices for developing a policy. Um, so these are all available on our, on our website um, in more detail. But these are the, what I consider to be the key components of a good policy. Um, making sure you define things clearly, connecting. I heard both of you say that you've connected to other existing policies or mandates within your organization. Always tie it back to other things that you have to do or are striving to do so that you can make the case. Um, Directly addressing the use of standard certifications. Again, I see that in most of the policies that are presented today. Um, that makes that's sort of the easy button for purchases a lot of times. So if you found a standard or certification that your organization is comfortable with using all the time, put it in there. And then you can revise it every year or two to make sure it's still correct for the time. And then I think number five is a big one, defining the responsibilities. Um, and who has a decision-making authority, making sure there's someone that the buck stops with. So, you know, Shannon said it was in there that the sustainability coordinator will track. The details weren't necessarily in there, that's how. Um, so at the very least, make sure you have someone in there that's accountable for making sure progress happens. Um, and then if you can, maybe outline how it's going to happen, how often, who, who you're going to report to, and whatnot. Um, those, those things are all very important get those in there, I think you'll be set up more directly. Like so use state contracts. The survey we did um, in advance of this, it looks like most of, you, most of those who responded are using state contracts. 
Um, I, I can completely understand why awareness of all the state contracts that are available to you is not there, and that's fine because it would be overwhelming. Um, but at the very least, our website, PTA's website, is on this subject is overdue for upgrades. But at, at the very least, right now, um, on our sustainable purchasing page, we have a state contract page that has the, and the specifications that we've incorporated into the contracts that we've worked on. So at the very least, you could go to that to get an overview of what contracts would be considered sustainable at this point. And there's the contract release number, which is how um, the buyers would know to access the contract. Um, and, and then you can see what makes it sustainable. So we have, you know, we've worked on the electronics contract, so the computer contract, the multifunction device contract. Those all require UT certification. Um, the janitorial paper contract require, well, um, most of the products on there are either green seal certified or 100% recycled content. Um, we have our off-slice contract offers good pricing on recycled content paper and really great pricing on remanufactured tumbler cartridges. So highly encourage you to utilize that. If you're worried about increasing your spend on paper, you can reduce it on purchase of toner. You can kind of pair those, those axes together. Um, another area that we started working on is sustainable furniture. We have a state contract for furniture that isn't only for sustainable products, but we've identified the products on the contract that are um, contain, um, that don't contain certain toxic chemicals. Um, so that's an opportunity for you to easily identify um, a sustainable product. So, Generally speaking, I just want to say if, if, if you are looking to make an area of spend more sustainable, um, let me know. I'd be happy to help you identify which contracts might meet your needs or point you in the direction of, of good resources once you've done your prioritization and figure out where you want to take it. Uh, requesting the data you need. Um, this is an area that we as a state are really working hard on and are not there yet, but um, we would like to we would like to request data that would allow us to run our state spend on goods and services through the life cycle analysis model that we used previously. Um, but to do that well, you need to collect a lot of information. And so that's what I have up here is sort of um, a sample usage report that we would like to see for our priority products and services. Um, you need an item description because you need to know what, what type of product it is and not just is it a shirt, but what material is it made out of? Um, you need to know how many you buy, how much it is per unit. Um, and then that, that uh, second column from the end, the UNS PSC code, no one wants to give us that. Um, or actually, really, the people who manage the contract don't want us to ask for it because it can be hard for vendors to, to provide that information. But that is the, item, the element that goes into the life cycle analysis tool that allows you to do the analysis. So there's ways to back into it if you can't get that data, but you know, this is sort of like the world, and then you can narrow it down from there. Um, you can certainly tailor your, your data requests of your suppliers to the particular product um, that you're working on. So if you want to track your <coughs> purchases, you can use like to measure through the calculator. Like I said before, that could just be, is it a, a notebook, a desktop, you know, tablet, how many, and what level do you need? So you could keep it super simple if you're worried about making too big of a demand. Um, but ask your, ask your vendors for data. They, they do it. They're doing it for us and more. I mean, they're doing it for Walmart and, you know, the big purchaser. So they can do it. Um, but, but work with them to, to ask for what you need so you can start tracking. It doesn't have to be for every contract, obviously. Too much data won't get to it. But think about what you want to report on and what you're going to focus on and make those apps of your vendors. So the green group mentioned already, but um, I would love to have folks who are really getting their hands up into this work um, to talk with and network and troubleshoot. Um, we do have some counties that have gotten more engaged in this work, um, but there's not enough of them. And if we had more city folks who were interested in discussing this, um, please let me know. I'd love to add you to the, to the distribution list. And right now we're just meeting um, twice a year. So we just met in April, we'll meet again in October. 
if you'd like to be involved in that or if it would be helpful to you, I'll be happy to get that going. So these two websites, um, the bottom one is our, our, our current page for our sustainable purchasing program that has that link to a page that has all of our state contracts that we've had um, a role in making more sustainable. And, and within that, the actual specifications that we incorporated in those contracts, so you can see what makes that contract sustainable. Or if you're developing your own contract for that same product type, you can just mirror what we see if that's helpful. Um, and then we also have the results of our um, sustainability spend analysis and the ways that we're going to try to um, improve our uh, sustainability of our IT contracts. There's a bunch of random resources on there, but do for an overhaul. And then the um, top website is Admin Office of State Procurement, formerly Materials Management Division. I think we have a list of them. They're now the Office of State Procurement. Um, that's where you would get to the state contract. So um, your buyers should know how to get in there, but that's, that's the link to search. So I'd just like to say that um, I'm super grateful to have been able to sit in and hear a bit more about how two cities are working on um, their purchasing. And I loved hearing how you're sort of focusing in, in certain areas that make sense for you at the time. That's sort of what I was getting at. Prioritize. It doesn't necessarily have to be the way I suggested prioritizing. It could be that your city is focusing on um, recyclable and compostable products. Great. Dig in and do what you can. Um, and then um, start working with the willing partners in your organization to make that happen. I think that that's a great opportunity if you can find something that people are passionate about. Um, making sure they realize they have a role to end in their So now I just thought, um, Philip said that a lot of times there's good, good discussion that people can have. And so I, I have some questions up here, sort of along the same lines of what Shannon and John presented. Um, what successes have you experienced? What challenges have you experienced? Do you see any immediate opportunities that are available to you? And most importantly, what can you go back and do, maybe not today necessarily, but in the next coming week? to um, reignite if you haven't necessarily had time to spend on this area. What do you think you could do to um, get that going again or refocus? Um, I'll throw up the paper. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy Sean and um, do another uh, uh, update in our um, staff newsletter on the policy as a gentle reminder that we are still working on this and our opportunities to contact myself as a resource uh, and or um, other staff who have been involved like our solid waste team. Um, so thanks, Sean. And thanks, Joanna, for having us do this because, uh, again, it's getting me to focus on this again. So, so that's my commitment. I would throw out the question, does any city feel like it would, would be better to have one centralized purchaser or or does that just sort of gum up the works and slow down purchasing at the state level? Purchasing coordinator, single purchaser? I don't know if there's a problem with it happening. It, I think it's convincing an organization who has not done it that way to mm -hmm. consider going that route, um, and that would probably take a long, just, yeah. very long conversation with a lot of people over a long period of time. And, and if the uh, results came to be that they thought it was a good idea, then they would form the position. But that would be a huge overhaul, that would be a huge. huge to go from what we have to. I mean, it's not that it's not worth it. But where it would land in the high priorities of big initiatives, uh, it probably okay. wouldn't. It would probably take a lot of heavy lifting to get us to, to do that. Does any does any city have a centralized purchasing? I think that's one of the benefits of choosing specific product areas to focus on because then you're not trying to just say, buy sustainable or have to boring, that would be great. But you can say <laughs> that'd be easy. Right. <laughs> we are buying compostable products through these channels or we are buying, you know, EP registered computers. You know, like then you can send yeah. a more simple message. 
that's the way that's one of the ways to address decentralized systems. I have a question on compostable products and purchasing compostable products when you don't have composting versus reusable products. Is it you know is it a gateway to composting or is it just sort of a is it greenwashing? So I just, and what, what are the perspectives from um, you all? I personally think, and I think our facts agree that if you don't have these compostable um, uh, bins, then it, don't do it. Um, one of the challenges that I know, that I've heard from our, our team in with um, implementing the zero waste packaging ordinance is that a lot of these organizations are switching to buying compostables, but they don't have bins yet. And so there is a lot of confusion and and it's just not everyone's understanding that this is not just a buying thing, that it's the end of the house thing too and everything in between. So it's a challenge. On the plus side, if you have more people buying compostables, hopefully that's gonna bring down the cost of them in right. the future. Um, but I I would agree. It doesn't make sense to be spending the extra money if you don't have um, I might disagree with you saying, of course, at the front end, you're getting a product and there's some plant-based material rather than oil-based or some other product. So you're promoting that. Um, you're generating you know, more of a market for that itself. So even if you don't have composting, I can use that for sure. And, okay, so... Hey Brown on the webinar had some comments and so I was gonna try unmuting her, which we haven't done before. Yeah, so oh, sure. um, right. Sarah, if you're ready, here we go. Okay, you should be able to talk. We can, but close the volume up. Uh yeah, try try again. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Oh, great. Great. Hey, sorry, I have a meeting shortly after this, so I couldn't attend in person. Um, thank you. Um, Joanna, Sean, and Shannon for presenting. This has been really helpful for me as well. Um, one win that I wanted to share with people is if you are updating Tungsten, which is the invoicing system we use here at the city, I have them create a sustainability flag for us. So we were bringing in Tungsten. We have a the sustainability flag now. So now when people are making and paying their invoices, they have to check whether or not this was a sustainable purchase. And that's allowing me to have a bit more, it's not necessarily automated, but a way to pull reporting on um, how people are purchasing. I'm glad you brought that up, Tara, because I think our finance department is uh, procuring tungsten and we'll be launching that next year and I'm hoping that that will be a tool I can utilize as well so I can learn from you on that. Great. Yeah. Thanks Tara. I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. <laughs> so tungsten is an off-the-shelf um, software package that allows online ordering? It's, a, it's like an invoicing system. Yeah, I, I can't speak that much to it. I just know I've been dealing with issues with um, our utility billing and capturing, getting bills so mm -hmm. we can implement into D3 and I'm working with our new, we have a bunch of new people in our um, finance and department, in the county department and he told me that it's going to help us once that's launched. <laughs> I think it's like our SWIFT, so oh. something along that line. So I don't know all of the features okay. and I don't know what suite of features we will be buying, but mm -hmm. I was told that this could be very beneficial. For reporting. I'd like to add one more thing on the compostable conversation. We, at the state, we wouldn't recommend buying compostables necessarily, mostly because, if you don't have organic collection, um, mostly because the life cycle benefits aren't necessarily there um, if you're not putting them into an organic composting facility at the end of their life. So um, it's true that if you're, if your priority, it all depends on your organization's priorities. If you're worried about toxicity from styrofoam products getting into your coffee. That that would maybe steer you towards a non styrofoam cup. But um, you know, it takes fertilizer and a lot of the fertilizer used in growing corn and soybeans is petroleum based. There's actually a lot of petroleum that goes into producing compostable products. And so if you're not ending up putting it into an organic system and composting at the end of life, 
the environmental benefits may not be there um, for buying it. So it's all about looking at what your organization's priorities are, and if it is that you want to shift from a petroleum-based product that simply because you leach toxic chemicals into your um, food or beverages, then you may choose a compostable product over a therapy product. But you'd have to look at the life cycle. And um, the obvious solution to any of that is to reuse. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I and mean, with most of our cities, I was doing that dishwashing paper with you and take a little bit of extra time. But when the Germans come to visit, <laughs> they're going to make fun of you. I really question why you have compost uh -huh. materials when you can use the conditioning plant. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a part of a uh, city exchange program where five Minnesota cities go to Germany. And we come here and we went there and everywhere we went, of course, we had glasses and things. And, and they come here and they're like, what is up? But actually, aren't some cup, is, is it, are BPAs used in the mining of some plastic or even uh, paper cups? I'm thinking about toxicity, right. toxicity right. issues around. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know that a lot of paper cups, not that aren't certified. Non-certified compostable paper cups have a plastic lining. I don't know if it's natural lining. Yeah. And also, you have to think about where it's going. So, if it comes up there, you know, works, you don't want to be buying that brand. So, either like BPI certified or Cedar Creek approved is a pretty good standard to go with. Since then, been doing the heavy testing out in Oregon, I think it's Oregon, um, or is it Washington, to to see the long-term impact on their processes from compostable. Um, all the stuff that comes in their compost. So they've been doing long-term mm -hmm. studies on that. So that's why we allow BPI or Cedar Creek approved as our two standards for compostable products that we buy. Picking back off of that kind of question, so you mentioned a few times about sustainable electronic purchasing. Mm -hmm. So do you also have a sustainable electronic disposal program? Yeah, so the state the end of life management like state electronics um, is a little bit frustrating because of security issues. Um, there's a little less reuse that goes on. Um, there's reuse internal to the state infrastructure, but um, we're not doing the you know, donations to the private group. Yeah, yeah, PPL group. Um, but we have um, Electronics recycling contracts that um, you know the recyclers and paper are certified, and so um, we have those contracts in place. Um, and we we would like to we're, we're trying to address it two ways. One is the products that can be sent back to manufacturers for reuse. We're trying to see if that's possible. We're encouraging more use of the state surplus system, um, and also trying to find ways to extend the life of products. So if an organization has historically replaced their computers every three, three years, we're trying to see if there's a way to change that policy to a longer life. But um, yeah, we do have the we do have a state contract that's available to all of you all for electronics recycling. Yeah. I have a question about the state purchasing contract. Um, so I used to work for a city, and no one ever told me that there was a state purchasing option. So yeah. what training or um, where would you go to get training on, on that kind of stuff? Is that at the um, office of state procurement? procurement? Yeah. Do they do trainings? Are there webinars? Do you expect cities to do? <laughs> it's such a good question. I, I mean, yeah, now I've been here nine years and I, I have attended the Office of State Procurement holds authority for local purchase ALP training. That I think must be just for state purchasers. Hmm. Um, and in those trainings, you get the whole rigmarole of state contract use and you know, all that stuff. I know they rely heavily on the demand that public, uh, other public entities like cities and counties bring to our contract. There's such heavy use by, we call it the cooperative purchasing venture, CP members. Which are non-state agency purchasers in my contract. The state, the spend from those purchasers is huge compared to state agency spend in a lot of contracts. So we rely heavily on. But 
it's a, I don't know yeah. if they do outreach and education to you guys. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to make that a project of mine to go back and talk yeah. to them about. We have something we can they Maybe yeah. we can set up a yeah for invite all green yeah. cities or. We talk to them about that because you guys have many options for procurement. You don't have to use the state property contract. You could use um, what are the other ones? No, but there are, there are several other buying cooperatives that you have the liberty to use. Um, right. So the state is in direct competition with those. It would make sense that they would want to reach out to you know, <laughs> and say, use our contract. So um, there's got to be a way for us to partner, um, you know, maybe through this lens of sustainable purchasing um, to showcase those. And then that would also like to allow them to do more business on the other contract. So I will, that's my homework. I'll get back mm -hmm. to you all. Um, we have a hand raise from the webinar. So, Julie, I'm going to unmute you, okay? Oh, maybe. Nope, she's self muted. Never mind. Oh, there we go. Julie, can you hear me? Okay. Maybe it was an old question. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to keep track. She can also type in. Yeah, that's true. Okay. You know, you know, I was thinking that. Um, Can you hear me now? Oh, yep. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, uh, you know, someone had walked in my office and I didn't hear what you had asked me. So my apologies. Oh no, I just noticed that you had the like hand raise button pushed on the webinar, so I was wondering if you had a comment. Oh, my apologies. That was from about an hour ago. But thank you. I was just going to say that I was thinking that we could, it sounds like, Jenna, you'd be, um, uh, you'd be fine with inviting Green Sub Cities to the, uh, every six months, yeah. meaning of the Green Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, in fact, every time you send me a policy, I think I reached out to the, to the person who submits the policy. Yeah, and yeah. They, Please come, and then they say, "Oh, I work ten hats, so <laughs> probably not." But, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I, would, I would love it. I would Maybe love it. Maybe the blanket, it. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the next meeting is. You just, be, we haven't set the date, but it would be in October. Okay, because we yeah we can put it in. We have the, the quarterly yeah, yeah, yeah the newsletter where the email listserv. The listserv, yeah. Yeah, once, yeah. We, once we get a date, I will. Okay, let me know, and I'll make a note, and we'll just um, we'll invite people. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much to our speakers today. Uh, we'll give